Today I will be talking about the topic of translation. And I've chosen this topic because it, I think it's something that we all do. I know when you have a large event like this and seminars and lectures, you know, we expect a lot of specialization from the speakers. And with the range of students that you are, you know, you're coming from very different areas of research. I mean, you sure got some commonalities. But one thing that I found is that it doesn't matter whether you're doing classical, medieval, ancient, modern, early modern, you are all going to be dealing with a range of languages. And at some point, you are all going to be translating something. <laughs> and uh, throughout my own career, even before I did graduate studies, I already did a lot of translation work. Later on, after a master's, PhD, translation work continued. And this includes not just a written translation, but also a lot of spoken or oral translation as well. We're not gonna focus on the oral today, spoken translation, that's got a whole other set of skills. We're gonna be talking about written translation. Now, what I would like to do, just to sort of get into the, the lecture itself, I believe we have 90 minutes, an hour and a half. So hopefully we can do 60 minutes of the lecture and leave 30 minutes for Q and A. If you have some absolute burning question in the middle of the lecture, okay, just, I don't know, put up your hand or hit the buzzer or do something. Um, but we will have time at the end anyway. So just kind of note it down and we'll get into it. And to be a little bit kind of boring, I'm going to, I'm not gonna use a PowerPoint and I'm not just gonna have, you know, talking head. I'm gonna share with you uh, a Word document and I'm, I'm just gonna be reading from that Word document. I know it sounds like, you're saying, why do we need the person? Just send us the document, we can just read it. Um, if I send you the document, you probably won't read it. But also it means um, that those of you, a number of you aren't native English speakers, you might not be used to my New Zealand accent. I think if you hear me and you can read it, your attention is going to be higher right if we just hear or we just read you pick up so much you remember so much if you've got the end i hope you can remember something after this class okay so without any further ado let me no i have to even find where is that <laughs> where it is that document. This is very strange. Okay, just on the sharing tab, it's not showing up for me here. Here we go. So is this all coming through for you now? Can you see that word file coming through? Okay, good stuff. So the title is just a very simple translating Buddhist texts, theory and practice. Matthew Osborne, that's me, Oxford, that's where I'm at. I'm going to skip over the abstract. If you're interested, you've probably already read it. And the content is already in this lecture itself. I'm going to begin with a translator is a traitor. There's an expression in Italian, uh, traditore, traditore, two words which translate into English as translator traitor, which is to say that a translator is a traitor. A translator is a traitor to the author of the source text and also a traitor to the reader of the target language, simply due to the fact that there can never be 100% equivalence or correspondence between languages. Some change or distortion must occur. While we must accept this as a bare fact of life, the question of how much distortion or change is not fixed. There can still be good or at least kind of better translations, along with translations that are not so good, bad, or just plain horrible. Now, how to assess the quality of a translation is also not determinate. There are a range of possible criteria, each of which may have more or less validity for a given case of translation. In the case of Buddhist texts, Jane Attia's review of four English translations of the Vimalakirti Nadesha is an excellent example of how to assess a given translation. And in that study, 
she concludes that uh, there is still room for greater reflection on the status of all translations. And while there can be no perfect or definitive translation, there is much to be said for the ongoing process of becoming more conscious of our own inevitably constructive role as translators. So becoming more conscious of translation. The translator in many ways stands between the author or authors in the source language and the target language audience. As such, we should not consider translation as beyond the sphere of hermeneutics, named after the Greek god Hermes, who conveyed the messages of the gods to the human world. In Latin, hermeneutics is interpretari, which is literally to speak between the author and the audience. This is just as the English word translate means to carry over from one language to another. When we stand between author and audience, carrying the former's words in one language to the language of the latter, the role of the translator's own understanding is critical and comes to the forefront. While hermeneutics, the word or the idea of hermeneutics, took on a very broad philosophical significance in 20th century Western philosophy, particularly in Europe, in Germany, a slightly older sense of this term hermeneutics from Schleiermacher in the mid 19th century, um, well, actually, you know, from the late 18th to the early and mid 19th, was, quote, the art or skill of understanding. Now, this was in turn divided twofold by Schleiermacher, a technical or grammatical aspect, but also a psychological or cognitive aspect. Um, Schleiermacher introduced the notion of the hermeneutic circle, which he explains as follows. Even within a single text, the particular can only be understood from out of the whole, and a cursory reading to get an overview of the whole must therefore precede the more precise explanation. Now, we could easily adapt this notion to create a translation circle. So to translate an entire text, individual parts can only be translated typo with respect to the whole. And a cursory translation to get an overview of the whole must therefore precede the more precise translation. Due to the need to understand each individual element, translation often, often entails a greater demand than broad summary interpretation. And I've heard someone say that the role of the summary interpreter is like being an old person eating food, so that you know they don't have many teeth, so they can choose what to chew what to swallow whole and what to spit out. Now the translator of an entire work on the other hand is forced to confront every bite and morsel and every bite must be chewed, swallowed and digested. There is no translation without understanding. So chew your text thoroughly. As scholars of Buddhism, the task of translation and interpretation is central to our discipline. Those of us working on texts, be it manuscripts, critical editions, synoptical comparative work, textual cultures, historical work that utilizes archives, or those who focus on doctrines, which in turn are sourced from texts, deal with translation every day. But those of us doing sociological and ethnographic work also interact with speakers of other languages who often use the idiom of Buddhist traditions and large quantities of our field notes must be rendered into the language that we seek to publish in. So despite the centrality of translation, we seldom approach the task consciously and explicitly, which leads to numerous problems that permeate our scholarly goals. Now, I'll just stop for a second here. So I'll give you know, one example. Um, I mean, how many of you are, are learning some language, some canonical language during your training? It's probably most of you. And we call the class, say, say Buddhist Chinese or Buddhist Sanskrit or Pali or Tibetan. But what do we mostly do in the class? Mostly it's about translation, right? You sit in the class and you show you understand by translating. So is it a Sanskrit class or is it a Sanskrit to English translation class? They're kind of synonymous. Okay, back to our document here. Several decades ago, um, Griffiths gave a scathing criticism as he coined a phrase to describe a dialect comprehensible only to the initiate written by and for Buddhologists namely the infamous Buddhist hybrid English. Now, even someone who's only cursorily sat in a Buddhism 101 course 
will be forced to confess that they have encountered such a dialect. Now, I will not be as brutal as Griffiths was here, uh, but not because things have improved a great deal, because I don't think things have really improved that much. Um, it seems to me that the most important step at this point is simply to bring the act of translation into the conscious light. Um, and a huge amount of translation theory and exper expertise has been generated in other fields, such as Bible translation, that are still quite pertinent to our own situations. Now, an overview of the entirety of modern Buddhist translation far exceeds the scope of a single lecture. And I also wish to speak today from experience. So as such, we will here examine four critical theoretical points or kind of reflections in the translation process that I've constantly encountered. And each point will in turn be illustrated with examples drawn from recent and soon to be published translations of Kumari Jiva's translation of the Xiaopin Vulnerable Lo Miqing, um, the small perfection of wisdom. So what are those four points? The first um, is the question of formal versus dynamic equivalence. Uh, much can be learned from the great biblical translator Nidda in this regard, though scholarly and lay readers' expectations need to be balanced. A further compounding factor is when the text in question is already a translation, such as is Chinese translations of Indian works and is not consistently or consciously dealt with this issue. And this connects with point two, which is the translation voice. That is, which or whose texts are we translating? When working with Indic texts in Chinese, for example, while philologists tend toward the underlying Indic text, later traditions reinterpret texts through the lens of various schools of Chinese Buddhist thought. It's important to explicitly state the voice, not to claim it as original, true, or superior, but simply to clarify a particular point of view while leaving open the possibility of translations through other voices. Three, preservation of a text's overarching structures. Uh, beyond mere chapter or section headings embedded in the text, many works include multiple levels and layers. The ways in which these are presented in translation without forcing external systems upon the text are critical for understanding and reading usage. And they also display a good example of the hermeneutic circle between the text as a whole and in the parts of the text. Fourth, representation of oral qualities in texts with oral origins when using a modern printed form. Many Buddhist works contain prose passages, litanies, call and response passages, poems, um, exclamations and so forth and other such literary forms. There are ways of representing these oral forms on the written page in a kind of a semiotic shift from oral, oral to visual, and they can produce some quite powerful results. Okay, so first let's look at formal versus dynamic equivalence. Um, the first reflection concerns the opposing styles of translation known as formal equivalence and dynamic wow. equivalence which is in turn premised on the notion that there can be no perfect equivalence or correspondence between any two languages. So Eugene Nidda, whose work on biblical translation has been so influential in translation studies, explains it as follows. Formal equivalence focuses attention on the message itself in both form and content, with correspondence from sentence to sentence and concept to concept, where one is concerned that the message in the receptor or target language should match as closely as possible the different elements in the source language. And this is what determines standards of accuracy and correctness. On the other hand, a translation of dynamic equivalence aims at complete naturalness of expression and tries to relate the receptor to modes of behavior relevant within the context of his own or her own culture. It does not insist that one understand the cultural patterns of the source language context in order to comprehend the message. So it does a lot of cultural work unpacking for us. Now in practice, um, often some compromise between these two approaches is applied and it's a spectrum between formal and dynamic rather than binary, either one or the other. Now, it's safe to say that in recent decades of Buddhist studies, um, formal equivalence has made room for dynamic equivalence, which revives the original work in new garb the majority of scholarly translations are strictly formal equivalents. Oh, now, I should note here, often when people talk about you know, literal translations, um, really there's no such thing. 
Um, but we might say that what we normally call a literal translation falls into this category of a formal equivalence, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, this is because, as Neda points out, formal equivalence is still of great value for linguistic specialists who wish to have insight into the characteristics of the source language. So, for example, scholars of Mahayana Buddhism who use Sanskrit and Tibetan but are unable to work with the Chinese versions of their texts are able to profitably compare English translations from the Chinese with parallel texts in Sanskrit and Tibetan for their research. So they want to preserve the formal qualities. For this reason, formal translations often further stimulate comparative studies rather than merely falling into the now disproven notion that Sanskrit texts are somehow more original than the Chinese or the Tibetan. It is these formal translations, though, that tend toward the dreaded Buddhist hybrid English. Uh, Non-specialists need more accessible work, and this is all the more so when the texts contain idioms, references to other cultural elements, metaphors, and other indirect language that is not directly so-called literally translatable into the source language. A translation that is fully worked into the source language will also strike the reader with quite a different effect. And I translated for many years before I really kind of learned this, and I've tried this myself, experimenting with translating texts without using any terms or words borrowed from Buddhist or other Asian religious sources or languages. For example, translate without even using the word Buddha, even though the word Buddha is now being adopted into English dictionaries. Only personal names remain in Sanskrit or Chinese, but even this is due to considerations that personal names in English seldom have any other recognizable meaning unlike in Sanskrit or Chinese. A related matter is that of translation versus transliteration. Now, Chinese Buddhism in particular has a clear distinction on this, um, the distinction between ee -e and ne. -e. And I do not wish to go into the history and the details and the validity of the various reasons or grounds for using ee -e versus ne. -e. But one thing is clear, though, about transliteration or phoneticized terms, and that is that they are non-native to the source language and they will impede comprehension and retention. Um, now, this is just simply because many readers will mentally switch off when they encounter terms and words they don't understand. Um, so let's take a few examples of how um, this works, say, from Chinese or Sanskrit into English, comparing transliteration versus translation. So Chinese, we might have banrubol <clears throat> omi, and this will just often get rendered into Sanskrit, paraknao paramita, versus, say, English of perfection of wisdom. Siti huan in, chakra devanam indra. And a lot of people, because this is phoneticized, a lot of people think that this is a name. Um, it's not really a name. The only name is the word chakra. Devanam indra means lord indra of the gods, devanam, because this is a plural genitive. So there's quite a big difference when somebody's reading and they, they hit this term chakra devanam indra, and they don't really know what this means. They're kind of, ah, oh, it's confusing, strange new word, three words. But if you put chakra lord of the gods, um, it makes a lot of sense. They can understand it. Or, for example, Deepankara Buddha versus the awakened one, lamplighter. Now, putting a couple of these principles and comparisons of formal and dynamic together, let's compare, for example, the opening passages, just very, very simple, right? The opening passages of a sutra. Um, from the Ashtasahasrika Prajna Paramita, that is the perfection of wisdom in 8,000 lines, and formal and dynamic translation into English. So the Sanskrit, um, even the name of the text, of course, would be just left in Sanskrit, Ashtasahasrika Prajna Paramita, Eva Maya Shrutam Ekasman Samaya Bhagavan, Rajagrahe Vihardi Sma, Kurudkuta and Parvate Mahata Bhikshu Sangena Sardam Arda Trayodasha Bihir. And um, if we use Kamara Jeeva's Chinese, Xiaopin Ban Rubolo Miching, Rusubo and Isu for Zaya Soe, Chan, Chisu Ku San Zong, Yuda Bicho Seng Chien, Uba Wusa Ren Ju. The name would maybe be left in just Hanu Pin In. Now, for a formal translation into English, probably we'd leave the Sanskrit or we might do the Pin In like that. But let's look at the text itself. And thus it was heard by me at one time, the Buddha dwelt in the city of Rajagraha on Mount Kudundukutta, 
together with the great Sangha of Bhikshus, 1,250 people in total. But let's look at a dynamic translation of the 8,000 line perfection of wisdom. Once upon a time, the awakened one was living on Vulture Head Peak near the capital city of King's Palace with the great monastic order of 1,250 monks. Now, many of you may be perfectly comfortable with the formal translation. <laughs> Some of you may feel that that's, that's, just, that's most accurate and appropriate. Um, but remember, you are Buddhist studies specialists. So you know all these technical words. But if you try reading the two English versions, the formal and the dynamic translations, to English speakers who know little or nothing about Buddhism, so a bunch of first-year undergraduates, then do a little test on their comprehension and retention, and the results will speak for themselves. They will, people will, will understand this and they will remember the basics. They'll remember that it's called Vulture Head Peak. They will not remember that it's called Gridakuta, because Gridakuta doesn't mean anything to them unless they know Sanskrit. <clears throat> now, if you try this with like a whole text um, and you say, if you're like, a, you know, even for myself, I, I know the Sanskrit and I know what all these terms mean, be it Sanskrit or Chinese or a kind of a English with Sanskrit. But I, even I'll confess that this very dynamic version kind of hits me in a different way. Now, another area where formal versus dynamic translations have great differences is that of figurative language, um, for example, metaphor, simile and idiom. Such language is, when we really examine our text, far more prevalent than we usually think. This is because many metaphors are so common, we cease to see them as such. The shape our thinking and ideas remain, for which they are known as cognitive metaphors. So for example, the words buddhi or buddha, which mean awakening and awakened for the Buddha's realization and insight. I mean, it's a metaphor, right? The metaphor is waking up. Um, but the term enlightened or enlightened or enlightened one conveys a different sense because it's a different metaphor. Now, we tend to think of metaphor as, you know, term A is a metaphor for term B, that A is a metaphor for B. But strictly speaking, it's actually the interrelationship of A and B, the two terms together that constitute the metaphor. The former is the metaphor's vehicle and the latter is called the tenor. Now, why one term can stand in for another term is not linguistically intrinsic, but it's highly conditioned by linguistic cultures. So calling someone a dog in the USA or he dog is not the same as calling somebody dog in Saudi Arabia. The understanding and what's going to happen is going to be totally different. So do we preserve the original metaphorical structure from the source language or do we create a new metaphor in the target language? If the latter, then we need a full analysis of that metaphor to preserve the structures and implications and make sure the original idea is being conveyed. Now, this is no easy matter. Often the terms are preserved, but the message is not conveyed if one is overly formal in translation. Now, in the middle of chapter one of the Xiaopin um, Perfection of Wisdom is a network of metaphors for the Mahayana Bodhisattva. Now, the passage is long, so I'm not going to quote the whole thing. I'd just like to share some dynamic translations of individual terms to show how, in general, we can preserve the physical and uh, the figurative structure. So the terms are Pusa, Moha, Sa, Da, Sheng, and Zhuang Yan in Sanskrit, Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Mahayana, and Samnaha. Um, no, all very standard terms, and usually in English, these are translated as awakening being, great being, great vehicle, and adornment. In my translation, I've translated quite differently. I have an awakening being, a great hero, great chariot, and armor. And this is actually based, this is what the text itself is saying. This is not interpretive. <laughs> this is entirely what the text is saying. Now, the usual formal English translations display little or no connection between the terms. So what's the connection between these? It's not much. But following the explanation of the text itself of these terms, we can express the sense of the awakening being as a great hero or a great warrior who binds on the armor and goes forth on a great chariot battling Mara by cutting off the view of a soul 
and cutting off the heads of existent living beings. Now, the rich imagery is, is palpable, and so too will be the audience's reception of this passage if we translate in this sense, preserving the metaphors. Now, ultimately, the question of whether to lean toward formal translation or dynamic translation will most likely come down to the aim and purpose of the translation and its target audience. While scholarly audiences tend towards the formal, there are still differences between specialists and non-specialists. Likewise, for so-called practice community audiences, there's a spectrum from beginners to well-informed exegetes. And there's also the general public has a potential audience for a given translation. Second point is translation voice. Now, even having settled on whether to use a formal or dynamic translation, there is still then the question of which translation voice one is to translate from. There are a range of potential voices, which again lie along a spectrum. At one end, there is the voice of the so-called original author situated within their historical and cultural milieu. In the middle, any one of a number of traditional ways of reading the text. And at the end of the range, the possibility of bringing the text into the present. So for ex example, for an extremely popular text such as the Heart Sutra, right, Banara um, Sinjing, if we look at the large range of published English translations, we usually see not just a translation of the text itself, whether it's from Sanskrit, Chinese, or Tibetan, but a substantial commentary accompanying it. It's because the sutra is so small, right? It's like two pages long. So they write a whole commentary that goes with the translation. These commentaries are almost universally from the perspective of a particular Buddhist tradition, which in turn influence the very translation idiom of the text itself. So some examples, this includes um, Master Thich Nhat Hanh's interbeing interpretation, modern and classical Chinese Zen approaches um, through Master Sung Yin and Red Pines, two distinct Tibetan uh, traditions, um, the Geluk and the Kagyu from um, Tenzin and Thakdun, that's of course the Dalai Lama, and um, Thakdun Jinpa as translator, and also from Karl Brunhosel from a different Tibetan tradition. And another translation that wishes to make a comparison between Buddhism and physics. So only Konza's version really attempts to translate and explain the text as an early to mid-period Indic Mahayana work. Now, despite the criticism um, Konza's translations often receive for being jargon filled with Buddhist hybrid English, really quite horrible, at least he was clear about his translation voice. Now, this is not to say that the other translations are incorrect but simply that while approaching from a particular perspective, they seldom make that explicit. And it leaves the uninformed reader with the impression that their translation is simply what the Heart Sutra is at core, irrespective of a given tradition of interpretation that was developed. Okay, so let's um, consider several possibilities of translation voice. Again, we're gonna use Kamara Jeeva's translation of the Xiaopin Perfection of Wisdom as an example to show the range of possible translation voices that you could take for an English translation. So the first one, should one render the Chinese text back to the supposed Sanskrit or other Indic original, and then translate that text in its Indian system Laban at the point of composition? So you're treating it as a Chinese text, but it's really an Indian text. Now, this would be no easy matter for while we may compare with the later Sanskrit manuscripts of the Ashtasasari Ka that we have now, there are places where the Shalpin obviously differs. And we don't possess the Indic text that Kamaraji by himself used. So ascertaining the actual Indic text behind the Shalpin would involve a fair amount of conjecture. I mean, it's just basic philological work, but it's still conjecture. So two, thus should one take the voice of Kamarajiva and his translation team as the basis of translation? Now, even this could easily diverge into two positions, as Kamarajiva's own understanding and reading of the text as a native of Indic language and culture, in addition to his depth of erudite Buddhist training, would differ considerably at times with that of his disciples, such as Sing Rje or Sing Zhao. So how could we separate these two streams? Okay, because, yeah, they're right, the, 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 the translation we have is a combination of these two. So while we possess the preface, the shu, to the xiaopin, to confidently take the voice of sing rei or sing zhao would ideally require a commentary composed by the translation office similar to the zhu wei mo jie jing um, by sing zhao. 
Ritan Winkamarajiva and the same group of translators were working on the Vamalakirti, right, the Wenwatsinga. The problem here is that there is no such reference point, and it would have to be another sort of artificial construction. There'd be a lot of surmising. I mean, perhaps one could use Da Tzu Lun to serve as a basis, but that's a commentary on a different text. A third possible general voice or range of voices could be any one of a number of later Chinese understandings of the text. So for example, how could this text have been read by um, Tian Tai Zi? Or how would Chan Master Huineng read the Xiaoping Sutra? Or how would Fa Zhang from the Huayin tradition read it? And, and so on, right? Now, this would be a kind of standard Chinese Buddhist sectarian reading. Um, now, while we often know enough about such Buddhist luminaries to be confident in our understanding of their thought world in general, we would again often still lack specific merit material to guide a translation or interpretation of individual passages throughout the Xiaoping, right? So that wouldn't be a translation. That would really be our interpretation of a Huayin or Tiantai interpretation of this text. So moreover, the decision to choose any one of them over the other voices would also require justification or explanation. Finally, one could render the text into a modern voice, leaving aside the time and place of either the original unknown authors, Kamarajiva's Translation Bureau, or other later Chinese Buddhist tradition. Of course, any sort of modern translation um, into a modern language other than Chinese will have some form of modern voice. I mean, English is a modern language. There's no ancient English. <laughs> um, so such a translation would have parallels with a dynamic translation that we mentioned before in terms of style. Such an attempt into English uh, would differ from recent efforts in Japan, China, Korea, Taiwan to render classical scripture into modern Chinese, often by employing classical Buddhist terminology, but with modern grammar and sentence structure. It, it's not the same thing. However, a full transition to the present day world would also necessitate greater changes above and beyond the mere words and sentences of the text and into its meta structure and core teachings. So, for example, dealing with metaphor and analogy, right? U, P, U, both explicit and implicit, cognitive metaphor, or the use of gendered language or, or, or characters. So, for example, if we were going to then make alteration to genders, gendered roles, how would a female main character in the Avadana at the end of the Xiaoping, right? So, Changti Pusa, we make Changti Pusa female, and then we change the um, Zhang Zinyu to a male, we call him the son of a rich family, how would that affect the story's plot line and symbolism? <laughs> That's a very big question, right? So according to Newmark's list of translation types, we could easily see how leaning heavily to the target language and historical period can quickly lead to more of an adaptation than a translation. Now, adaptations can be popular, immensely so, but they're not translations. Now, for my own translation of this text, um, given the range of possible translation voices I've just mentioned, I chose here to take the voice of Kamara Jiva as my basis for translation, or rather as close as I could reasonably get to Kamara Jiva. Our Xiaoping in Chinese was translated by Kamara Jiva, and therefore we do not need to conjecture about what an earlier text may have said or what a later commentator could possibly say. As a translator himself, who was fluent in both the Indic original language and the Chinese to a sufficient degree, Kamara Jiva's choice of Chinese terminology provides us with an excellent tool to understand and translate terms and ideas. So that's to say, when comparing the Xiaoping with the later Sanskrit manuscripts that we have, a given Sanskrit term still has a range of possible meanings. So what shade of meaning do we use to translate into English? Kamara Jiva's equivalent Chinese term also has such a spectrum of sense meaning, giving us a number of possibilities again. Now, by triangulating between the Sanskrit and the Chinese, the overlap, we can narrow in on how Kamara Jiva understood and interpreted a given term or passage, and from there render a suitable English term expression or sense of meaning. Now, we can further strengthen our confidence in Kamara Jiva's usage by referring to his other translation works, such as the uh, Sudama Pandarika, um, where we can see which Sanskrit terms lay behind his choice of Chinese in translation. 
And by this method, Kumarajiva's translation can be seen not merely as a translation of the Shelpin, but as a commentary. And that commentary helps us understand and therefore to translate more accurately. The third reflection is on structures and the relationship between textual parts and wholes. Uh, now we've already encountered this to a degree when we discussed the hermeneutic circle above. Um, the structuralist Howarth states, individual elements of a system only have significance when considered in relation to the structure as a whole, and that structures are to be understood as self-contained, self-regulated, and self-transforming entities. Hence, it is the structure itself that determines the significance, meaning, and function of the individual elements of a system. Given that the overall structure is thus more critical than the individual elements, this is how we need to then approach our translation work. Now, I have seen all too often students working in canonical language classes. I teach Sanskrit, I teach Chinese, uh, hunkering down over their Sanskrit and Chinese or whatever, making sure that they have definitions of each and every word, sentence by sentence, but not taking enough time to examine the function of those sentences within the larger textual passage and the passage's role within the text as a whole. You see this very often. You see a caught in the words and missing out on the sentence on the paragraph. Now, the Mahayana scholar um, Dan Boucher explains uh, textual analysis from this perspective should proceed then from the macro structure of the text to the micro structure of the word or phrase seen not as isolated units, but for their relevance and function within the narrative frame. The translation, uh, sorry, the challenge then is that we need to be very familiar with the entirety of a text before we can properly translate any given sentence or passage. I'm sorry, there is no shortcut. <laughs> you, you need, you've got to try to understand that text as a whole and do that background reading. My work with the Perfection of Wisdom is a perfect example of just how important our understanding of textual structures is for an integrated translation. Now, much earlier scholarship on the sutra led by Edward Konza considered the Ashta Sahasrika to be the product of a chaotic process of accreted smaller components, wherein the resultant form lacked any overarching structure. He literally called it chaotic. Where a statement lay within the text as a whole was seldom if ever considered in determining its significance. Now, my own dissertation, Chiasmus in the early Pragna Paramita, Liter Literary Parallelism, Connecting Criticism and Hermeneutics in Early Mahayana Sutra, later published as a monograph at the University of Hong Kong, expressly set out to argue that the text has a complete and integral structure. I identified and analyzed the entire Ashta Sahasrika Pragna Paramita Sutra, utilizing all the available recensions of the text, and concluded that it is built on a form of inverted parallelism known as chiasmus or ring composition. And in Chinese, this is uh, jiao cuo jie gou, or um, jiao cha jie gou. There's a few other names in Chinese for it. Or huan xing, huan xing jie gou. And now these are essentially structures of small, medium, or large scale that are found in a huge range of ancient literature in many cultures. Essentially, when the individual thematic elements of the text from start to finish are laid out, they set out, reach a climax, and then return back to the beginning in reverse order with the form A, B, C, D, E, F, G, da, 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 X, da, 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 G, F, E, D, C, B, A. So it goes forward and back in reverse. The prologue and concluding framing elements A and A dash are followed or preceded by inverted and paired themes or sub themes B, C, etc., all of which highlight a central turning point X. Now, the paired elements A, A, B, B at the front and back, so forth, may be themes or story elements in a large scale chiasmus, or even just repeated phrases or words in a smaller chiasmus. Moreover, it is possible that, dependent on the central point X, such paired elements are essentially inversions or mirrored images of each other. So just stop a sec. So like when you see yourself in the mirror, it's not what other people see, right? Because in a mirror, the left and right sides are reversed. 
right? It's you, but it's actually like the opposite of you. Most important elements are threefold. The framing points A and A dash, which set out not only the intended goal or aim of the story or discourse, but also its resolution. And the center point X, which is the focal point carrying the heaviest narrative weight or significance. Okay, now, as a picture, is worth a thousand words, an analysis of the Avadana story at the end of the Shaopin Prajnaparamita, so that's the story about Chanti Pusa. There's just one example of these inverted parallel forms that also span the entire text from start to finish. Now I'm going to try to show you this here. I'm going to just shrink the screen. You don't have to be able to read it, okay? Don't panic. If you can't read it, that's okay. But I want to show you, it's getting very small, isn't it? <laughs> So at point A, the themes at point A are matched at the end again, it's repeated. Some of these ideas of B come up here again at B. C, the content of C of entering Samadhi comes back here with the same list of Samadhis. The test of Mara and the main character cutting himself with a knife is repeated here again. Mara appears and again, the main character cuts himself with a knife. The daughter provides presents or gifts. Here, the daughter is a gift. And then there's a teaching. And what happens in the middle, this sermon on the Tathagata's body, the Buddha's body, also reflects the issue at the very start of the text. And it's finally resolved at the end of the text. So we've got this A, B, C, D, E, F, X, F, E, D, C, B, A structure. Now, the discovery of such chiasmic structures has led to groundbreaking theories in a host of studies of classical and religious literature, totally transforming notions of their composition and their thematic content. It also, of course, should influence how we translate such texts. Now, while it should not cause us to rewrite the source language to fit the pattern, we must make sure, for example, that the connections between the paired elements remain within the translation. So in the Avadana above, um, that includes making sure that there is consist consistency between explaining why Siddha Paradita Tantipusa weeps due to not seeing the Tathagata and not hearing the Dharma. So Tantipusa, why is it cool? Just to not hear the Dharma, not hear the Dharma. The metaphors for hearing and seeing the Tathagata's body and hearing the Dharma in the middle. And then at the end, Siddha Parodita can see the Tathagata and hear the Dharma. Or, for example, there's a particular term where Mara blocks people from hearing the hero's calls and drawing blood. That's in point D. And then at the end, Mara hides the water and then there is further bloodshed. We've got to make sure that some of these terms clearly connect to each other in translation. The translator must keep in mind the significance of an individual element within the structure of the entire story. We can easily get caught at the micro level, losing perspective on the macro narrative, mistaking the forest for the trees. It was necessary to make sure some of the terminology in one section, such as when Sadar Parodita cuts his own flesh with a knife, was preserved later in the text when he drew blood again with a knife. The expressions for seeing and hearing at the start of the text and the end needed to be the same or at least very similar so that the reader, consciously or unconsciously, would connect these two sections together, bringing about a psychological sense of completion that the story's driving question had been resolved. Good storytelling need to pay attention to detail. The next point is, sorry, that is the fourth point, not the fifth point. This brings us to the fourth reflection. Ancient texts known to be chiasmic often had oral origins, and the Pragnaparamita is an early Mahayana text is no exception. It features various signs of orality that underline the entire early mainstream Buddhist literary corpus. So, for example, there are various types of oral typology, which mark out very short literary sections, akin to perhaps like a modern paragraph. So in writing nowadays, we can use a full stop 
we can use a new paragraph, right? We can start a new page and it breaks down the content, but we see that. But when you're speaking and reciting, you use other forms. So like vocatives, right? O Buddha, O Subhuti, reactions of the gods, confirmations of earlier assertions to mark resolution of a topic, and so forth. The use of pericope and formulae is another such feature. Together, these can build structures, many of which involve repetition of a stock formula, which may further expand into a litany, where at each iteration, a key term or terms in the formula can change or develop. Now, a formal translation must, of course, render this oral typology by English terms, but there are other ways of highlighting these in the written word distinct from how they may function orally. So here's an example of a litany in the text. Now, you, you don't need to be able to read it. You can see it on the page and know that it's repeated, right? So, O world honored one, not attached paramita is this pragna paramita, just as the levels of the hearers or pratika buddhas are not discriminated. O world honored one, not discriminating paramita is this pragna paramita, just as discrimination is equal. O world honored one, an immeasurable paramita is this parami, pragna paramita, just as measurable things do not arise, etc. Now, when you structure it like this on the page, what I was trying to get, the effect we're trying to get, is that sense of patterning. When you hear it out loud, this is going to be repeated. It's got a rhythm to it, right? Oh, world honored one, something, something, paramita, is this pragna paramita, just as some reason. And that's repeated over again, over and over and over and over. And it has a particular effect when we hear it in that way. Likewise, visually, when we're seeing it on the page, to see the structure, we see that rhythm, that pattern, right? And we're trying to get like a similar effect using the visual that originally the text would have through the oral, through hearing, speaking and hearing. As this is a visual interaction with the text rather than oral, some pictures may suffice to demonstrate how it can be done. Now, some more examples. Now, the first example is a litany with the opening vocative of O World Honored One the oral typology of each repeated formula. So it's a, here it uses a vocative to boom, make a point, boom, boom. Each one has this vocative. This is followed by a statement about the Prajna Paramita and then a comparison. And it's been formulated to suggest rhythm and highlight the individual elements within a formula. Now, this is just a short bit. This actually covers several pages in a translation. The next one, if a bodhisattva does not practice in form, does not practice in the arising of form, does not practice in the cessation of form, does not practice in the destruction of form, does not practice in the thought form is empty, does not practice in sensation, perception, volition, cognition, does not practice in the arising of cognition, does not practice in the cessation of cognition, does not practice in the destruction of cognition, does not practice in cognition is empty. This is namely the practice of prajnaparamita. Now, there's a lot of repetition in the in the middle, right? Like variations on does not practice in, and then we're moving through the five aggregates: arising, cessation, destruction. Thinking of it as empty, right? You might lose it, but then when we get to the end, this last line: this is namely the practice of Prajnaparamita. By setting it off back into the page, boom! It's a very clear resolution, and it caps off this repeated content. content. In the middle. For Bodhisattva does not practice in a certain way, this is namely the practice of Prajnaparamita. And visually on the page, we know where the key points are and what to focus on. The second example is a single clause opening of if a Bodhisattva, followed by a long list of things they do not engage in. Passing it in this fashion on the page aids in overcoming, forgetting the initial point, what of what is technically speaking a single sentence of extreme length, right? So it also helps us there. Now, a third example is similar, highlighting repetition around a general idea. Thereupon, Shariputra spoke to Subhuti. Due to what reason is it known as grasping? Subhuti said, O Sariputra, if gentle sons and daughters differentiate that form is empty, just this is known as grasping. Differentiate that sensation, perception, volition, and cognition are empty, just this is known as grasping. 
Differentiate past things, future things, and present things. Just this is known as grasping. Differentiate that a bodhisattva who is first aspired will gain some merit. Just this is known as grasping, etc. So by structuring it like this on the page, again, we can see that repetition. We see the variation, but also the key themes come out. To me, seeing it, having it like this on the page makes me recite it and read it with that rhythm, even in my own mind. Each of these have been formatted as written words on a page to try to bring out the oral features of a text. Now, another example of orality pertains to poetics and also has structural features. The use of counterpoint couplets, right? Duilian is a very common feature in classical Chinese writing. Um, most modern editions of Buddhist texts simply present the text line by line without any structuring. And Buddhist uh, beginners can easily overlook the patterns. Again, they may find themselves mired in the word by word analysis and translation, missing the overall form and the way in which it should be presented both visually and orally. So note the difference when we present the exact same content from seeing Ray's preface to the perfection of wisdom in two different ways. So firstly, unformatted. I mean, you see this on the page. It's just a bunch of text, right? So at first glance, this is simply a thick block of text with rather obscure and dense content. But on reformatting it according to its multi-level couplet structures, becomes a bit poetic. Don't know if I should read it out again. Maybe I should. Yeah. I mean, you can even break this up here if you like. You can do a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, if you like. And then I'm going to break this out here, actually. So our translation should follow not just the similar form, but the English word order should also be paired along with, where possible, a pairing of syllables to affect rhyme and meter. So in this case, this is not very good, but anyway, the Pragnaparamita Sutra, the axiom which fathoms the principle to fulfill the nature, the vast norm by which the Bodhisattva becomes a Buddha. If the norm is not vast, then it will be insufficient to indicate the resolution of the many differences. If the nature is not fulfilled, then how can beings attain true awakening on ascending the site of realization? That by which true awakening is attained, that by which the many differences are unified, how could it be anything other than this path? So it gives it a bit of rhythm. My meter isn't that great. The syllables don't quite add up but I'm trying to structure it in similar ways as you can see, right? You know, for example, the something which something, here we go. If something is not something, then da, 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 to some conclusion, and then similar structure to see it, that by which something is past tense verb. And again, how could it be anything other than this path? The end result is similar to the prose examples above with further development of complementary paired structures and their potential rhythm and meter. So you want to think like, what is the sound out, out loud? Um, too often we abandon such literary features in our translations as we strive solely to be semantically accurate. So this means we often just worry about making sure we have the right meaning, but the texts are more than just meaning. You know, this this here is not just meaning. There is there, there are literary qualities in here, and I'm sure that um, the author spent a lot of time making sure that it was very nice and proper and followed the, the correct forms. And when we do that in English, we get a similar result. 
If I can give a couple of examples here also on the oral, um, we often have poems in Buddhist texts that in translation are no longer poems. <laughs> so for example, if you look at the Lotus Sutra, right now, Fa Lian Hua Jing, many chapters, so like um, the Universal Gate chapter, Paul Men Pen, you've got a whole large section in prose, which is then repeated in verse. But if you look at most of the translations of this into English, the verses are not verses. There's, there's no rhythm, there's no rhyme, there's no meter. People are just trying to make sure they translate the meaning, but not the content. But if you think of that as a text that would be recited, right? You need that rhythm, you need that meter. That's part of the whole practice of reciting. This is the ways in which Buddhists practice and use these texts, and we should keep this in mind. A really nice translation would also preserve those as well. Now, of course, it's going to be very difficult, <laughs> but we should keep that in mind. There is one example of um, English Buddhist text translation that does preserve meter for poems, and that's the old Pali text society translations from the Pali canon. There's a lot of, a lot of verses and poems and gatta, buddhana in those, and they turn them into um, poems, often in iambic pentameter, very classical English poetry. Um, and that's something that you seldom see and that's been lost. Okay, last but not least, um, I know that many of us translators often receive requests to translate some term or sentence. Um, somebody sends you an email, hey, what's this word mean? Translate for me. Usually the requests are made without context <laughs> on the assumption that the meaning of the word is somehow inherent in the word themselves. Now we know that the meaning is not easily so easily disclosed. Um, we do not, sorry, not only do words take their meaning from the sentences in which they are found, but within paragraphs and whole texts. Texts which are in turn located within traditions in an ever widening circle of semantic connectivity. Um, this content itself can be presented in a variety of literary forms, including the poetic and metaphorical, and with prolific use of culturally bound idiom. So for these short requests that we often receive, we have neither time nor inclination to respond with a definitive analysis of possible translations, just no time. But when we work on translations of the texts, which are the subject of years and decades of our lives as scholars, the art and craft of translation and interpretation demands critical reflection on all aspects of the text in question. Now, I hope today that some of my own experiences and reflections thereon may provide some nutritious literary thought, literary food for thought, for others engaged in all aspects of the translation of Asian philosophical and religious works.